Good evening and welcome. My name is Paul Holm. I'm the academic director of the Trinity Long Room Hub. I cannot think of a more apt title uh, in today's circumstances than the one for tonight. Tonight's inaugural lecture uh, titled Reading the Situation, How the Humanities Will Guide Us Out of the Current Crisis. This is what Maurice Biriotti promises us. And way back in 1996, when Maurice was a lecturer in Cambridge, he realized that the humanities are too important to be kept a secret to aficionados and students. At the heart of Morris's argument, as far as I understand, is that literature is all about the stories and aspirations that drive us as humans, and that when businesses look in textbooks for solutions to their strategic problems, they really rather should read Tolstoy. This is not just a slogan. This insight helped Morris create a thriving international consultancy which today has offices in London, Paris, and New York, in addition to collaborators around the globe. What he and his employees do is share their love for the humanities and by doing so unlock a deep understanding of why people behave as they do, as leaders, as colleagues, as consumers, as citizens, and translate these insights into concrete actions, directions to drive impact and results. The company differs from all the behavioral models in the business world by firmly maintaining that understanding what people do is not the same as understanding why they do it. In the past, Morris and his company SHM Productions have worked with organizations like Ofcom, the Department for Education and Skills in the UK, the Department for Business Innovation and Skills, the Big Lottery Fund, the Department for Transport, and Tesco to provide insights into what's going on in the minds of key communities of consumers, users, and stakeholders. They've worked with businesses such as Daejo, Unilever, Accenture, and Thomas Cook to develop operating models, process frameworks, organizational structures, and team development programs. They have helped large operational programs in businesses like Unilever, Accenture, BT, HP, and Ernst & Young to stick to their plan and execute the strategy, avoid unnecessary conflict, uncover more potential value creation, and speed up the implementation. All of this and much more coming out of a consultancy made up of humanities graduates. Morris is on the board of Tomorrow's People, a charitable trust dedicated to helping people out of long-term unemployment, welfare dependence or homelessness into jobs and self-sufficiency. And he's also a director and trustee of the Kids Cookery School, an organization dedicated to improving levels of inclusion and attitudes towards nutrition in areas of high social deprivation. Morris's academic credentials are impressive. As I said, he set out as a lecturer, first in Hispanic studies in the early 1990s at the University of Birmingham, uh, later moved on to be a lecturer at the universities of uh, Barcelona and Mexico City and Stanford. He's been a senior visiting fellow at the University College Cork also at the Hispanic Studies Department. He's been a senior visiting lecturer at the University of Zurich and a special professor in knowledge transformation at the University of Nottingham. Currently, he's a visiting professor in humanities and business within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the University College London. 
And he's given talks on a wide range of subjects. Common thread to all of that is questions about what drives us as humans. I'll just give you a couple of his uh, recent lecture titles. Communicating for Change, Technology, Social Networks, Quality of Life, which was presented at the conference uh, on HIV AIDS in Mexico City earlier last year. Uh, to be followed up by a lecture, Learning from Ovid, Literary and Organizational Transformation, given at UCL. Uh, he lectured at Paris in last June on designing a methodology to develop social action research. He is lectured in San Francisco in December on transformations and metamorphoses. And on the big question, what's in a library at Cambridge recently? Tonight, Maurice Biriotti emerges as the Trinity Long Room Hub Adjunct Professor in Humanities Innovation. The Trinity Long Room Hub is the Trinity Research Institute for Arts and Humanities. And universities certainly do have a way with words, don't we? Compare the nine words and 56 characters that make up his unpaid but illustrious professorship with us to his reasonably well-paid job, day job title as CEO of SHM. Three words, eight characters, economy with words count for something in business. Enough said, I give you Maurice Biriotti. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, a, few, a few responses to that. First of all, where the hell do you get all that from? I have no idea. I guess it's the perils of the internet, so thanks for that. Uh, I found out things about my life I, I hadn't ever heard before, actually, which is terrific, so thanks a lot. Um, uh, secondly, um, there's an incredible glare. Are you, are you all getting blinded by my bald head in the back? Because it just feels like there's an unbelievable glare coming here, so sorry about that. Um, uh, secondly, I don't know what it is about lecture theatres, but I always feel very strange in universities. It's very different in, in the business context. In the business context, I don't know what it is about people who go into business. They always try and get close to the speaker. And, uh, and yet there's this weird... It's like a force field. It's like you know where the speaker's going to be, so you're going to go as far away as possible. And I feel like I'm having to you know, virtually have a video link to the people at the back in order to, to talk to you. So, anyway... Um, I am uh, indeed going to talk to you uh, about the kind of work that I do, um, and uh, Paul has already said um, quite a lot of the things I was going to say in the talk, so that's, that's a bit of a, a downer, really. Uh, but I will, I will try, nevertheless, to uh, bring some of the stuff to life. Um, and I'm going to proceed in a way that's uh, slightly unusual for me when I'm lecturing. Normally when I lecture, what I like to do is to focus um, on uh, a profound analysis of a single text and how uh, a particular text or a particular artefact has helped me in my work. Um, I thought for this evening it would be more interesting perhaps to give you an overview. And so I'm going to touch on a lot of different things. And uh, I do feel uh, an enormous pressure in doing this. When I uh, joined the world of business uh, in 1996, um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the story in a second, but I had a profound sense uh, that I was nothing but a charlatan because I knew nothing about business. Um, 13, 14 years later, absolutely nothing's changed. I still feel that way. But I do at least feel I have some years of business uh, experience under my belt. Here I am coming back to the academy in a number of jobs that people have been kind enough to ask me to do, uh, visiting professorships, etc. And I do now feel just as much as a of a fraud in the world of scholarship as I did in, uh, once upon a time in the world of business. So uh, perhaps I just belong nowhere. So anyway, you'll just have to bear with me. Um, before I start uh, telling you a bit more about uh, my work and a little bit more about how I've used the humanities and how I see the current situation, um, I would just like to take this opportunity very briefly, um, uh, but the brevity doesn't mean that I don't uh, feel strongly about it, to uh, thank Paul and others here for uh, the chance to come and talk, but also to have a three-year appointment with Trinity College. Um, it's kind of a dream come true 
When I was a kid, I used to read about this place and see pictures of this place. And there was an extraordinary romance about it. And um, I, uh, uh, when Paul asked me to do this, I, uh, I had a little tear, actually. So I'm very, very delighted to be here. Uh, so thank you to all of you for, for putting up with me. I will just need quickly to tell you a, a little bit about what I've done and what my company does in order for the rest of this lecture to make sense. Some of it Paul's already um, spoken about, but um, I do feel that uh, a little bit of context would help. I was indeed, I confess, a lecturer in the humanities, in uh, literature and philosophy mainly towards the end. And uh, in 1996, in the British uh, education system, I started to become incredibly frustrated, incredibly irritated. Um, mostly that was my colleagues, actually. But there was one aspect of the irritation which uh, was more profound than that. And that was that I had this strong sense that in the humanities, what we study is stuff that really matters. And uh, I could feel that. I could feel that when I was a student uh, in the humanities. I'd read a book, and I'd feel like something transformational had happened to my life. And I'd see links between the book that I'd read and things that were going on in my life, a chat I was having with my mum, or problems I might be having with my girlfriend, or whatever. Um, and those of you who work in the humanities will know this feeling, this sense that when you fall in love with a work of literature or fall in love with a work of art, it suddenly spreads into a whole load of aspects of your life and becomes connected to everything. And I felt that there was something extraordinarily powerful about this. And that academics ought to be reaching out and finding ways of using the power of this knowledge to make transformation happen in the world. I was advised very strongly against doing so. Effectively, what I was told was that there were two models. There was the scholarship model, which was keep your head down and write in a way and talk in a way that three other people can understand what you're talking about. And if a fourth person can understand what you're talking about, you've sold out and gone commercial, and your, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your legitimacy is all over. That was one model. The second model that was available to me, which was rather sneered on, but nevertheless was a model that existed, but I absolutely didn't want to do it, was to become some sort of a broadcaster, to go on the television. Uh, I, I really don't want to do that, and I thought this is awful, and it's not what I'm talking about, because I'm sure both of these things are terribly important, but they're just not what I want to do. And I continue to be... Uh, absolutely in awe of the work of true scholars, people who've continued in the academy and done great work. And I feel one of the things that I want to talk about this evening is the importance of supporting it. But it just felt to me like it wasn't for me. And one of the reasons why it wasn't for me was because I felt that the stuff that I was dealing with was the stuff that people are interested in. So as I talked to my friends when I was an academic, people who weren't in the academy, people who'd gone into business or people who'd gone into banking or people who'd gone into policy or whatever, as I talked to them about what it was that kept them awake at night, it was never the spreadsheets. It was never the science of the thing. It was never the numbers. I mean, all that stuff is tricky. It was always the people stuff. And the people stuff that kept people awake at night was always remarkably like the sort of stuff that I was studying and writing about and teaching about when I was dealing with literature or philosophy. The questions that were really confronting them were questions of how do you deal with people's diverse motivations? How do you cope with the fact that people sometimes don't get along with each other? How do you cope with the fact that people find transformation terribly painful and terribly hard? How do you cope with the fact that people don't always behave rationally? How do you cope with the fact that even if you tell people a million times something and they believe you rationally, they still, they still won't necessarily do the right thing? That seemed to be what friends of mine who were outside the academy worried about. And it was what I, as an academic, was thinking, writing, and reading and studying about. There had to be a connection. I remember going to see... Um, the Dean of, uh, of Arts and Humanities in the university where I taught, and this is all safe because actually my last university, Paul got it wrong, so you won't find out who this is. It's great, I can tell this story. Um, and I went, to see, uh, I went to see this chap and I told him how I felt. And I said, look, I really believe that what we ought to be doing is getting out there and taking some of what we do and, and not saying that all the scholars in the university need to get out there and apply their knowledge. But some of us, at least, have to be given the opportunity to 
go and talk to businesses or go and talk to policymakers and to try and use what we know or at least what we understand or at least what we have insight into in an intelligent way. The response I get, I got, uh, has remained with me um, all these years, and I think I'll go to my grave remembering it. Uh, the, the, the sentence that, that was uh, uh, kind of emitted from his mouth was, you're a whore, Viriotti. That's quite striking. What I discovered, of course, was that at that time, uh, he was merely articulating what many of my colleagues felt. Many of my colleagues believed that something awful would happen to these wonderful disciplines of ours if suddenly we were to sully them with anything so base as talking to businesses or trying to think about ways in which they might be applicable out there in the world. Um, I was shocked by the response, but it became apparent to me very quickly that the only possible course of action was to leave the academy and to try and find ways of doing what I believed in, in business. In 1996, I got together with a couple of colleagues um, Sophie Manham, who was a filmmaker and uh, has the uh, misfortune also of being my wife, um, and uh, Henrietta Moore, who is currently the Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Cambridge and at that time I think was a Professor of Anthropology at the LSE. And the three of us got together and formed SHM, SHM No Great Mystery, Sophie, Henrietta, Morris, and uh, the two of them decided not to work full-time in SHM and I decided that I would make the leap and work full-time in SHM. When I say work full-time in SHM, when we started, we had absolutely nothing because we were you know, two academics and a filmmaker and therefore we had no money. Uh, I had £50 to invest in the company. That To this day, that's all I've invested in the company. All anyone's invested in the company is £50. Um, and we started with an idea. And the idea was that if you can understand, profoundly understand, what it is that motivates people, then you can make an enormous impact in the field of improving how businesses operate, how organisations work, how policies are developed, etc. That was our sense. I am happy to say, I'm going to cut a long story short because it's years and years and years that have gone by, I'm happy to say that all of these years later, um, SHM has been a success story. It's not an enormous company from the way Paul described it. You would imagine, uh, you know, 200,000 people working for me. Actually, it's only 45, but nevertheless, it's not a tiny company either. Uh, we work all over the world. Uh, we work for some of the biggest corporations in the world, and we work at the highest levels of those corporations uh, with people at uh, uh, senior executive and board level. Um, we lead very big projects all over the world, and uh, we, I'm very happy to say, make touch wood, because all businessmen are slightly superstitious about this kind of thing. We've been profitable year on year, and we've grown every year, including last year, in the middle of, uh, in the, middle of the, uh, the worst economic crisis uh, that I can remember. So, I think we've done all right. We've ended up working in a number of different areas. Um, Paul actually touched on them, so I'm not going to go into them. Um, normally what I do at this stage is, uh, if I'm lecturing to people for the first time, is to uh, go into detail on uh, one of our success stories, uh, partly because there's usually a, an academic kernel of, uh, of something interesting in there that um, I like to discuss with people who have an academic background, I'm assuming many of you do, um, and partly because businessmen just can't resist telling people about their success stories. Um, I'm going to do something unusual this evening. I'm going to start with a failure. Um, and uh, it's a failure to sell our work, which happened about three years ago. And I believe this failure had within it uh, some of the signs of what later happened to the economy. That's a fairly bold claim, but nevertheless, I'll try and tell the story and try and explain what I mean by it. About three years ago, uh, I did uh, something that uh, I often have to do, which is to go and see if my company can sell work. And uh, I uh, had a meeting with uh, someone extremely senior that I won't mention in an investment bank in the city of London. And this chap was a classic, very, very, very successful, very senior, uh, somewhat disagreeable investment banker. I shan't say his name. You won't catch me out, I hope, anyway. Um, and uh, my, uh, my task was to see if perhaps we could do something for him, for his organisation, and perhaps use some of our skills in, uh, in helping him. Um, his response was disagreeable in the extreme. Um, 
And it was a flat no. Now, because he's an investment banker, he speaks in a language that isn't English. He speaks in PowerPoint. And uh, the, way they, the way these guys speak is that it's all bullet points. So he told me my five bullet points and, you know, hoped that I would write them down to teach me a lesson. I didn't, just to annoy him. Um, and uh, he, told me, he told me the five bullet points. And he said, look, you've told me your story. I think it's awfully nice that you do all this humanities-based stuff helping people. That's fine if you think it's interesting. But let me just be very clear with you. There are five reasons why this is completely cretinous. Um, the first reason is that the two cultures are completely different. The culture of business and the culture of the humanities, they are totally separate. They are different ways of thinking. They have never been together. Uh, you can't put things together that shouldn't be together. And the way in which you're going about it is therefore, uh, I'm sure it's fine for some idiots who want to pay for it, uh, but I can't imagine that it's good for us. Secondly, you talk about human motivations. Well, frankly, uh, young man, he said young man, he's uh, three years older than me or something. Anyway, frankly, young man, uh, you know, frankly, young man, you know, there's only one human motivation that you need to understand, and that is the motivation to make oneself richer. That is all people care about. It's the only thing people care about in the end. I have learned this in years of being in business, and it's the only motivation that you need to take seriously. Thirdly, it's all very interesting coming to me with all this academic mumbo-jumbo. I've got academics coming out of my ears, let me tell you, from universities like Harvard and Wharton Business School, etc. And they know the stuff that I really need to know, which is how you engineer value through strategy. Now, you're talking to me about literature, you're talking about poetry, it's all very fine, but frankly, if you haven't got anything scientific to tell me, then I'm not remotely interested. Fourthly, the world is changing. We, meaning investment bankers, are transforming this world. We're transforming the way in which value, this is three years ago, remember, transforming the way in which value is created, transforming the way in which people think about money, transforming the way in which, of course, we ourselves make money. And this is marvellous. Uh, and you don't understand. You're trying to go back to the past. You're trying to use references to how people were in the past. And you can't do that because, fundamentally, we are a world in perpetual transformation. And finally, I'm all for the arts, dear boy. I'm all for the arts. I mean, just the other day, you know, we sponsored an event at the Vienna State Opera. And, uh, you know, I go to Glyndebourne once every two years, he said. And, uh, you know, I like it very much. But one of the reasons why I like it terribly much is because it's utterly useless. And we want to keep it that way. Utterly useless. So you're damaging not only business with the silly thing that you're doing, but you're also damaging that thing which you profess to love, which is the arts. My answer to you, sir, is no. Um, I thought that was quite funny, actually. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but of course, there was a bit of me that's, uh, that was hurt at the time and that's still you know, bitter and twisted up with misery because I didn't make a sale. So I'll try and put the bitterness to one side um, and continue on this, uh, on this path of trying to tell the story. Why do I think this story is so interesting? Well, there are two reasons why I think it's very interesting. Because uh, in his uh, grumpiness, this man revealed two things. The first thing he revealed was five fundamental fallacies in his five bullet points that I think have dogged the world of finance and have created part of this mess that we're in today. I believe that there is a fallacy that somehow if you are in business you have nothing to do with the human. This is nonsense. I believe that there is a fallacy that suggests that people's motivations are always about self-interest. I believe that there is a fallacy that somehow you can strategically engineer people's behaviour. I believe that there is a fallacy around transformation. I don't believe that transformation happens in the way in which the business schools say that it does. And I believe that there is a fallacy, a terrible fallacy, in which I'm afraid the world of the humanities is too often complicit. There is a fallacy around the uselessness of the knowledge generated by the humanities. Five fallacies that I think I won't elaborate how, because I'm sure that you can all see how these fallacies, in part, have led to the crisis that we're in today. But also, these five bullet points uh, were very useful to me in thinking about what my position actually was, because this was quite a good broadside to receive. It's quite good sometimes to see the enemy and look him straight in the eye and see what he has to say and try and understand how one might marshal one's arguments against uh, what is utterly, utterly stupid, but, uh, but plausible. 
I'm happy to say that I'm absolutely convinced today that he is utterly wrong. One of the reasons why I know this is because I do sell work. It's how I eat, as you can see. I like to eat, and uh, I eat quite well. And uh, my uh, 45 people that I employ, I hope, eat well too. And uh, we, we do this because we add value to businesses and uh, other kinds of organisations and institutions. Uh, we do that. We do that by using the humanities intelligently. So I started to think about these five different bullet points and what it was about them that I so fundamentally disagreed with. And I hope to explain to you today that there is indeed another way, a different way of looking at the world from the way in which um, our rather stuffy and patronising gentleman in his palatial offices uh, would have us believe. Let's look at his propositions one by one. His first proposition is a fairly common one, which is that there are two completely separate cultures. A lot of people have a great deal invested in this proposition, not only business people, but also people in the arts and humanities. Perhaps uh, my, my dean, if you remember, you're a whore, Viriotti, if you remember him, uh, my dean all those years ago had quite a lot invested in precisely such a notion. For him, for the dean, there was a sense in which getting involved with anything to do with too much filthy lucre was rather dirty, rather meretricious. Um, I did point out to the dean at the time that uh, every time I talked to him, he talked about money. Anyway, that got a little bit of a reaction. Excellent. There are lots of deans in the audience. Or something. Anyway, um, sorry about that. Um, and uh, it, it got me thinking. You know, why is it that we believe that there really are two such distinct uh, cultures? And I started doing a little bit of digging around. Because it seems to me that there shouldn't be two such distinct cultures. After all, uh, trading, exchange, negotiation, the stuff of business is entirely the stuff of being a human being. Uh, in fact, we even use some of the words of business when we're trying to think about some of the emotional things that go on in our lives. For example, the word negotiation. And it seemed to me, we negotiate our feelings, etc., with each other. We negotiate to tricky situations with each other, etc. And it seemed to me that um, it would be interesting to try and do some kind of archaeology of this and see whether uh, the two uh, cultures had indeed always been so separate. Now, there is a story that says that the two cultures have been separate. And that story uh, includes Plato and it includes Aristotle and it suggests that, of course, Plato didn't really want the merchants in the Republic. I mean, they could be there to sort of, you know, sell us stuff, but they weren't terribly useful. And that Aristotle looks down on trade, etc. Um, and that since then, the whole of the tradition of humanism, which turns into our contemporary humanities, the whole of that tradition has been one that set itself against the idea of commerce, etc. The life of the mind versus the life of the marketplace. Now... This story is actually not quite as clear as uh, people might think it is. Um, some time ago, researching a, a lecture on, uh, on Rembrandt, I came across uh, a very interesting character from the 17th century. And I'm happy to say that this is, this is a good time to talk about him because uh, the relevant uh, act that, uh, that I, I want to talk about is his inaugural lecture. Um, he gave an inaugural lecture in 1632 uh, at the uh, at the the beginning of the Athenaeum in uh, in Amsterdam, which later became the University of, of Amsterdam, and this character's name is Caspar Barleus. And hardly has anyone heard of Caspar Barleus? Just for, for the record, no. Uh, anyway, Caspar Barleus. Just, just to prove I'm not just making him up, it's not just like a Borges short story. It does actually. There is actually a Caspar Barleus over here. Um, and uh, he came up with uh, a very interesting concept. Now remember, 1632, what was going on? Amsterdam. Amsterdam was turning into the centre of the universe because it was the beginning of the notion, somehow, that you could advance your career, you could make a fortune through trade and commerce. Not just through high birth, etc., but through trade and commerce. And trade and commerce was suddenly going to become the way in which people were going to be able to distinguish themselves. Well, Barleus found himself giving a, an inaugural lecture at the Athenaeum. And around him, there were professors and rectors and all the rest of it, but there were also business people. And rather brilliantly, Barleus gave a talk about the relationship between business and the humanities. And here it is. Um, and within this talk, 
He makes uh, a number of uh, different, uh, sorry, I, don't, I never write my talks down, so now what I've got to do is find the relevant bit. I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, and it's in Latin, so that's the, kind of crazy, but there you go. Um, he, he, it, within the talk, what he does is he talks about uh, the importance of the mercator sapiens, the merchant that's wise. It's quite interesting that we have a term that our economists like to talk about and sociologists, which is almost the other way around, homo economicus, as if all of us were, as human beings, economic beings. This seems to be the other way around, an upside down notion. Just because you're a mercator doesn't mean that you let go of your humanity and doesn't mean that you let go of your need to remain sapiens. And he starts to talk about the need for merchants to engage in thinking about rhetoric, thinking about poetics, thinking about philosophy, thinking about the humanities. And he says, you know, why is it that I'm here in front of all of you chatting about all of this stuff? You know, am I, why, why is it that I'm talking to you about it? Uh, you know, amid the roar, tinnitus pecuniarum, all the roar of the coins of money going on in the, in the background. Why is it I'm talking to you about this? Um, and he says, you know, it's not that I'm doing it. Non ut eos de mercaturo lucro opibusque disuero. It's not, I'm not talking to you about all, all of this stuff. Ut lucrandi artes price scribam. I'm not telling you this stuff in order to tell you how to make money. I'm not telling you ut eos mercari doceam. I'm not telling you this stuff in order to teach you how to do your business. Sed sapienta. I'm telling you how to do this stuff so that you can do your business wisely. And he comes up with an alternative vision of the classics. So where this story tends to be that Aristotle was a kind of a fuddy-duddy that didn't like trade, actually he says, no, read Aristotle carefully. Go back to the politics, go back to the Nicomachean ethics. One of the things that Aristotle talks about is what is justice? When do we learn about justice? When we learn about justice is when we think about fair exchange. And when do we think about fair exchange? We think about fair exchange in the moment of trade. So Barletus makes an argument that sort of turns on its head the standard way of thinking about this and says, look, there's always been a connection between justice and trade and exchange. There's always been a connection between philosophy and business. There's always been a connection between being a decent human being on the one hand and being uh, 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 somebody in the marketplace on the other. And he exhorts his audience to think differently about uh, this distinction and to bring these two cultures together. Now, I could go on about Barlaeus for quite because he's a recent discovery, I rather like him. But um, uh, I won't. What I will go on to say is that uh, this fits in uh, also, it's something that, you know, Barleus is rather a recherche reference. A much more common reference is to Adam Smith, the great, uh, the great sort of initiator of thinking about political economy and writing about the economy and writing about capitalism, what capitalism means, etc. And uh, in recent years, scholars have tended to believe that Adam Smith did not write The Wealth of Nations, as has previously been thought, as a totally sui generis, completely different kind of book that meant nothing, that had no relation to anything else that was going on, but instead was a continuation of a much bigger project that he had, a project that contained uh, thoughts about fine art, a project that contained thoughts about music and about literature, but also, in particular, a moral project that he was initiating. He was professor of moral philosophy at the University uh, of Glasgow. And uh, Adam Smith uh, wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations, it's now believed, and I think it's a very compelling argument, having, having looked at the evidence, as almost a continuation of his thinking on uh, the theory of moral sentiments, in which he felt that the most important thing was for us to think about the condition of being human and the condition of that kind of fellow feeling, as he calls it, that we have one for the other. And that as we think about exchange, as we think about capitalism, etc., we shouldn't think about these things completely divorced from the moral and philosophical context, but instead we should think about it as a continuum. So I say to my friend in his palatial offices, there, your argument doesn't work, sir. It is not true that there's been, since the beginning of time, a clear division between commerce and the arts. Actually, it's rather more complicated than that. And it's really in recent times that the division and distinction have become so much more crystallised in our minds than uh, I think is healthy or necessary. 
Let's go on to his second uh, big contention. His second big contention, you will remember, is that there's no need to study human motivation. Well, no need at all. Because why would any of us study human motivation when, frankly, we only need to know one thing and one thing alone, which is that people are motivated by self-interest. And even if there are a few weird people who are not motivated by self-interest, let's face it, they're just weird. And uh, in the big scheme of things, they don't matter. Um, common sense suggests that this is a pretty stupid point of view. Um, we know that we don't act in our own uh, self-interests all the time, and certainly we don't carry out the kind of calculus that uh, business gurus uh, who model out the way in which we, they think we're going to behave suggest that we will. I don't think we do. I don't think we, we, we really believe that we do. And it's an extraordinary fallacy on which has hung an enormous amount of social policy, an enormous amount of economic policy, and it's amazing that it survived this long. Now, of course, there are many economists who have been questioning and challenging this notion. Um, most famously, recently, the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, uh, who talks about the fact that if we really were driven by self-interest, then we would simply be rational fools. Yes, we would be rational, but we'd be foolish, because actually there are lots of other things in life, not just self-interest, etc. Now, here, rather than trying to proceed to demolish our friend's argument each time, let me try and liven it up a bit with some examples of the work that we do and how we use uh, literature, for example, to try and resolve uh, problems in business. Um, for the last four or five years, one of the things my company has been doing, and I've been doing in particular, has been getting involved in conflict resolution. And in conflict resolution between companies, often what you're faced with is very, very, very tricky problems in which two organisations that had a deal suddenly find that they don't really have a deal, they don't like the deal, or they just don't plain like each other. And uh, they want to get themselves out of the deal or somehow uh, extricate themselves from, from a difficult situation. And I can tell you, in my mediation work, if I were to imagine that the only thing that drove the parties was a set of rational thoughts, if I were to believe that for a second, I would be a very, very, very bad mediator. People do things that are not in their own interests and not in their company's interests. And they do things because they are driven by different kinds of passions. Interestingly, when I started doing this kind of work, um, I was introduced to a field of uh, economic and social theory and mathematics called game theory, which some of you may have come across. Within game theory, uh, which is a very brilliant field, and I, I have nothing against it, it's superb, um, which I'm not an expert in, but nevertheless I've done some investigation into it. Within game theory, there is a notion that somehow, as long as you understand the game that people are playing, you can figure out rationally how people will behave, and broadly people will behave in that way. Game theory is really, really good at tackling difficult situations like how do you get the most out of an auction? So when, when governments need to auction off the rights to things, they use game theory to try and figure out how people will do things. People gave me a stack of books on game theory. They gave me a stack of books on conflict resolution. They gave me a stack of books on, uh, on uh, you know, self-interest and how to make sure all parties win-win, win-win. How do we get to win-win? Um, turned out win-win was a bit of a bullshit, actually. It just didn't really work. It turned out all the stuff on motivation was pretty much nonsense. And it turned out that game theory didn't really work. What helped me to understand this? Well, I have this view that uh, one of the great things we have at our disposal is, and I know it's contentious, and I understand why it's contentious, and I even agree with the fact that some people think it's contentious, but nevertheless I love it. We have a canon. We do have a canon. We have a set of texts which, uh, over time, have established themselves as the place that you go to for a particular kind of investigation. And this is an enormous treasure. We're in danger of throwing it away for all sorts of reasons, but it is an extraordinary treasure. If we found you know, another planet somewhere that had the canon, we would think it was amazing. It's only because we get quite hung up about it that we sometimes, uh, we sometimes want to chuck so many rocks at it. I understand why. But I tend to think, you know, let's go back to the texts that really speak of what it is that we're trying to, uh, trying to resolve. One of the difficulties I face as a mediator is a situation in which right means right, meets right. In other words, two parties meet each other and they're both right. That's what's hard about mediation. Now, 
I undertook a fairly significant study of a, an ancient Greek tragedy um, when I started uh, working as a mediator. And that study has uh, stood me in good stead for uh, a very, very long time indeed. The tragedy in question was Antigone. I'm not going to go into detail about my reading of it. Maybe that's, if, it, if anyone's interested and wants to invite me back, I can give different lectures if you want, you know, weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever. Um, but um, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that one of the things that I was really interested in the Antigone was, let's imagine, do you know the story of Antigone? The story of Antigone, very, very, very quickly, uh, Antigone uh, has a sister, is mean, she has two brothers. Uh, the two brothers have... Uh, uh, have, been, have been on different sides of a civil war. They uh, unfortunately met each other in battle. They killed each other. It's a terrible, terrible thing. So both brothers are dead. One of them was on the winning side and the other is on the losing side. The king, the winning side, says, well, well, we'll bury the guy on the winning side with for honours and the guy on the losing side will just chuck him out so that the birds can pick at his body. And Antigone said, oh, my brother, I've got, yeah, I've, got to go, I've got to go and bury him. I've got to go bury my brother. You can't, you can't force me not to bury my brother. And so, so the, uh, the drama unfolds. And uh, it turns into a, a, a disagreement, if you like, um, between uh, the, uh, the, the, the pull of the nation, the state, the needs of the state and state law, versus what Antigone refers to as a much more universal law, the law of nature, the law of, uh, the, law of the gods, etc., and it seemed to me that Antigone is a wonderful antidote to thinking that everything in life can be reduced to game theory. Because one of the difficulties of thinking about the world in terms of game theory, in terms of games, is that actually the trouble is most of us are in different games all the time. Antigone is in a game in which winning is about doing the right thing according to universal laws. She faces up against her uncle the king, Creon, who's in a game in which winning is about asserting his authority and showing that the state is supreme. They're in different games. If you imagine that you're in a world in which what you have to do is understand what their game is, like an auction, you won't understand Antigone. Now, it sounds trivial when I say it like that, but believe me, I've been able to use that again and again and again in order to resolve conflicts in businesses simply by understanding <coughs> that one of the difficulties that you have in conflict resolution is that people are actually playing different games. They're actually on completely different playing fields half the time. And the task of the mediator within the business context, and maybe in other contexts as well, I've never tried um, in other contexts, but the task of the mediator is to find ways of resolving the fact that people are playing completely different games so that they understand the different things that they're doing. They've got completely different planes of motivation. And unless one can do that, mediation becomes impossible. And what you end up with, of course, is tragedy. And all too often in business, that is exactly what happens, the level of misunderstanding. I haven't time uh, in this lecture to go into details about uh, how uh, Antigone has uh, proved such an important text in rethinking uh, how we go about uh, mediation work. But I will say this. Not only is the text terribly important to us, but so is the scholarship about, about it. And this is a really important point. Because it could be that I would be here saying, well, everybody, you know, if you're in a business, what you need to do is go out and read Greek tragedy or go off and read Aristotle or learn Latin and read stuff like this. I'm not saying that. Because that's not enough. Because these texts need to be interpreted and reinterpreted for what's going on in the times that we're in. And that is the task of so many scholars working in institutions like this. And it seems to me that it is appalling that any of that might be under threat just at a time where actually what we should be doing is looking precisely at those questions and how they've been tackled uh, variously by the canonical texts and other texts in our tradition. So let's go to uh, my friend's third objection. My friend's third objection was, if you remember, yes, I do, need, uh, I do uh, need academics, but the academics I need are going to be strategists. They are going to be people who uh, provide for me a sense of scientific fact, a basis of scientific fact on which I can base the way in which I think about my organisation. I want numbers. I want to know how people will behave. I want to know where we're going. I want to know who's going to buy this product, who's going to buy that product, what percentages, blah, 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 blah. You can't provide that. All you do is read sonnets. It's effectively what he's saying to me. Well, OK, is that a fair challenge? Well, of course, I work in a, in, in, a, in a business environment, and I run a business, and I do indeed 
have to have recourse to business strategy, and I do indeed have to use scientific forms of information in order to be able to run my business. I need to be able to look at profit and loss. I need to be able to look at the projections. I need to be able to look at profitability of different accounts, etc. Of course we need to use all of that. But the error, it seems to me, is always in the belief that just because we have some of those, uh, if you like, quasi or pseudo-scientific tools at our disposal, we will somehow be able to engineer real value in the world. And I think our friends, the bankers, got themselves into that muddle uh, in a terrible, terrible way because stuff starts to look true on paper when in fact, in reality, it's entirely different. I am regularly asked to intervene with my team on different company organisations that have been given wonderful, marvellous, brilliant, uh, shiny, colourful PowerPoint strategies by consultancy firms which they then try to implement and they have failed miserably to implement. And of course the, the academics from the business schools and the consultancy firms say, well you didn't implement it right. The strategy was perfect, you just did, did it wrong. If you'd done it right it would have been perfect because it's a perfect strategy because we're brilliant. I don't think they are brilliant. Um, I, in fact, I've seldom seen a strategy that's gone entirely according to plan. And one of the things that I've had to do is try and figure out why that might be. And my source of inspiration in all of this has been Tolstoy. Now, uh, there are lots of reasons why Tolstoy, but again, I'm just giving you some tasters today rather than the, uh, the, the full argument. Um, if you go to uh, a, a bookshop, and have a look for books about business strategy, I can guarantee that a very large number of them will have somewhere in the introduction some kind of reference to uh, von Clausewitz, the, uh, the uh, theoretician of war, uh, and his 19th century ideas about what makes a brilliant general, all inspired by Napoleon, all inspired by this idea that all you have to have is a brilliant strategy, and then amazing things can happen. Now, Tolstoy wrote, as you know, uh, War and Peace. War and Peace is a, an extraordinarily hefty tome. And one of the themes of War and Peace, a very important theme of War and Peace, one that sometimes gets forgotten because there's so much wonderful stuff to do with love and to do with uh, you know, seduction and romance, etc., and you know, a scandal, that we sometimes forget this stuff. But War and Peace is actually stuffed full of references to war. And Tolstoy wrote within War and Peace some of the most interesting things I think ever written on strategy. And most of it can be summarised uh, in this basic idea that a lot of strategy is tosh. And there's this wonderful passage in War and Peace that I think, uh, that I think really exemplifies this. Um, Prince Andre, those of you who read the, the novel, novel book, I don't know, is it a novel? One of the questions. Anyway, those of you who've read War and Peace uh, will know that Prince Andre begins as somebody who, at the beginning of the novel, Book. He believes that Napoleon's this great man and he believes that you know, he's going to be fighting on the other side with the Russians, of course, but you know, he, he, with his brilliant strategies, is going to be able to show himself to be intellectually superior than the enemy to the enemy and he's going to be able to do extraordinary things. As time goes on, he realises that all of those, that strategic thinking doesn't work at all. And this is an extraordinary passage where he finds himself uh, with his friend who sort of stumbled into the battlefield to see him um, at Borodino where a couple of, um, uh, a couple of German speakers um, just ride past. And one of them is Clausewitz, the actual Clausewitz. Right? And Clausewitz is, is all the other one, we don't know. One of them is saying to the other in German, you know, what you have to do in war is you have to expand into space. And Prince Andre, who's now very cynical about the idea of strategy, says these people understand nothing. First of all, when they talk about expanding into space, they're talking about expanding into a place where I live. They're talking about expanding into a space where my sister lives, where my father lives, where my son lives. They're talking about stuff as if it didn't matter, and it does matter. It matters passionately. Secondly, they believe that with their funny plans, they're going to be able to control things. I've been on the battlefield, and I can tell you it's never like that. No one knows where the hell they're going. No one knows which direction they're going in. Because in the heat of the battle, there is so much mess, there is so much noise, that no one actually understands what's going on. And you could say that one set of orders has been amazingly successful because after the event it looks like that was successful, but everybody then forgets that there were 30 other sets of orders which were completely contradictory, coming from different people. I'm afraid that's the reality of the way strategy 
turns into implementation in most businesses that I've been involved with. It's like a battlefield in which everybody thinks that they know what they're doing, in which everybody thinks that the stuff around them doesn't matter, people's feelings don't matter, people's lives don't matter, and in reality it comes straight bang face to face with the human. Contrasted to the figure of Napoleon, lionised by the military strategist school, etc., is the figure of the old uh, Russian general Kutuzov, who um, barely seems to know what he's talking about, barely seems to know what he's doing, is bumbling around, but waits and shows sentiment and fellow feeling, and in the end prevails through something that we begin to understand, or we come to understand through the pages of the book, is not brilliance, but wisdom. This has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily useful insight for me in thinking about why it is that so much strategy fails, and why it is that so much engineering of people's behaviour is such a criminal waste of time, money, resources, and in the end, whole lives and economies. Now, my friends, if you like, the positivists in the world of business, believe that there is no point in looking to the past because the world is always in a process of total transformation and flux. Anything that might have been written five years ago is irrelevant now, let alone 50 years ago, 500 years ago, or 5,000 years ago. It's just irrelevant. It's irrelevant because... Changes are happening that are so profound. In a way, I agree with them, and in a way, I don't. It's true. Things really do transform. People really do transform. It is true. Organisations transform. I've seen this with my own eyes. But the belief somehow that when transformation takes place, that bit of us, which used to exist in the past, disappears, is one of the most criminal errors, I think that's been committed by the business strategists over the last 40 or 50 years. And I see the results of it all the time. Um, sociologists talk about the results of it, the way in which people's lives have been completely shattered, decimated by the, uh, by the, the nature of a kind of working environment that seems to throw out everything that people could hold dear. Um, you can read Richard Sennett on the corrosion of character. You can read Alain de Botton's work. I mean, there are lots of different people, philosophers, sociologists, who've written about this. I always go back to the canon when I'm interested in a particular question. An awful lot of my work has to do with transformation. And the uber text of John Transformation, for me, has always been Ovid's Metamorphosis. And I read this again and again and again because I find more insights in it about the nature of transformation than all the business books I've ever read, which frankly, for the most part, are just so much tosh again. And one of the reasons why is because Ovid's Metamorphoses has a series of stories in it. And these stories usually are about an individual who undergoes some kind of extraordinary transformation into something else. But the interesting thing about that transformation is that we might make the error that is made by my friend in his palatial office of thinking that the transformation has turned one thing into another. But the real power of Ovid's narrative is what's left, what remains, of the old thing in the new thing. So one of the stories, for example, uh, the beautiful Callisto is turned into a bear. What's extraordinary about the story and the way it's described is that what really touches us about this story is that she frightens herself. What really touches us about this story is that there's still the woman or the girl inside the bear. We have the same feeling when we hear about uh, Daphne who's been turned into a laurel tree. Actually, we can now, I can never look at a laurel tree again without thinking of Daphne inside. What's interesting about transformation is not that we have actually taken away what was there before, but the thing that was there before is still there. A simple insight. And yes, I could talk about it much more, and I could talk about specific insights that I use from Ovid and ways in which I've used it with particular businesses. A simple insight, but a really profound one. 
Because time and time again, what I've found is that businesses, the management of businesses, have undertaken transformations and have left this basic fact to one side because it's inconvenient to them. And guess what? That which is inside always returns. I realise that I'm running out of time and I can talk a great deal and I never have notes, so uh, the structuring of my lectures is always uh, a little bit haphazard, so I apologise for that, but I will just come on to the fifth of the mighty points put forward by uh, our, our friend in his palatial office, which is the utter uselessness of the arts and humanities, and the three cheers that go up for that utter uselessness. I believe, as I said before, that business has been complicit in this stupidity, in thinking somehow that they never really have to consider this stuff. I have seen some really terrible things in the world of business. I have seen cobbled together bits of philosophy, uh, bits of Eastern esotericism, uh, bits of postmodern thought into nonsense ideas that are then used as part of training programs to try and bring uh, managers to a new level of consciousness. It's tosh. I have seen uh, businesses uh, pretending that all they need to do is turn their people into total positivists who believe that there's nothing that's so important or there's nothing more important than the numbers. It's total tosh. Yes, businesses have undertaken a kind of uh, destruction of what I consider to be important about the arts and humanities in the way in which they operate. Yes, they are culpable. But I think universities are culpable too. For ideological reasons, understandable ideological reasons, we don't like the conversation between uh, the world of uh, the humanities and business. It's dirty. It's dirty. It's about filthy lucre. It's not stuff that we should really be talking about. It's not stuff that makes us feel good. They're the enemy. They're the bad guys. We shouldn't talk to them. We shouldn't even talk about them. The only time we should talk about them is when we condemn their behaviour because they're probably polluting stuff, aren't they? And they're probably uh, exploiting people, aren't they? Well, of course there's pollution, of course there's exploitation, and of course some of the multinationals behave in ways that are lamentable. But that is not the way of all businesses in the world. That's not my experience of all businesses. Most businesses that I work with want to do the right thing for themselves, for their people, etc. And the silence from the arts and humanities is as much about the universities having locked themselves in their little towers and failed to communicate what's important, what's vibrant, what's essential about the work that they're doing, as much about that as it is about businesses blocking their ears. And I find that absolutely lamentable. Of course, the title of this talk was a bit of a come on how the arts and humanities are going to guide us out of the crisis. But if you think about it for a moment, if you think about my response to the five points, I hope you can see what it is that I think is in there that can help guide us in the right direction. We need to have a profound rethink of the way in which we negotiate, the way in which we trade, the way in which we think about the creation of value, the way in which we use people, the way in which we transform organisations. If we do not, we will continue to have crisis after crisis. Perhaps there'll be boom years, because for a time, just like in Tolstoy, it can look like the brilliant military strategist is doing something. It can look like it's working, but it's all, as has been so uh, eloquently demonstrated by recent events, a total mirage. There's nothing of substance there, because in the end, it's people that do business. And people are as complex, as mysterious, as varied in their motivations as they have always been. So what am I calling for? I'm calling for three things. One, for business to start listening properly. Not just cod versions of philosophy, not just three sentences about Aristotle in a book about business ethics. Proper engagement with the great stuff that's out there and the scholarship that's out there. We need to do that because the questions that businesses face are real human questions that affect all of us. The second thing I'm calling for is that the universities do two things. One is to learn how to engage with businesses. And the second is to carry on doing exactly what they're doing. Now that may sound contradictory, 
But in the field of mathematics, for example, no one has ever thought this was bizarre. There are pure mathematicians who go ahead doing things that seem to be totally useless. But they're not, eventually. Well, not all of them. Some of them are and some of them aren't. We have to keep funding the stuff that's pure because, first of all, it's beautiful, which is great, but also because somewhere in the stuff that we don't know the use of is tomorrow's big solution. And actually, if you think about the creation of all of our institutions, etc., uh, a lot of that has been exactly that kind of progress. Philosophers you know, idly thinking about liberty, for example, or idly thinking about problems, and all of a sudden that turns into a constitution of a great nation, for example. We don't know what the great ideas are today that are going to turn into the useful stuff of tomorrow, so we have to carry on investigating and carry on researching. But we also have to be open to dialogue, and we have to stop being so damn snobbish about it. And the third thing that I'm calling for is really very straightforward. I have, amongst my friends, two very great friends. One is the world of business. The other is the world of the arts and humanities. I just wish sometimes they'd talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morris. Uh, I understand that, that Morris will take some questions now from the floor, and if I can see you, I'll try and see who wants to ask the first question. The problem is those fiddly, fiddly bits can be beautiful. They can be inspiring. They can make you feel something. And there is this distrust of literature because no matter how deep and, and, and cogent the lessons in it might be, it also has an appeal to the emotional. How do you respond to that when, when people would ask I, 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 Well, I respond to that in, in two ways. First of all, by saying, you know, I think, again, you know, I've, I've been grateful for the work of recent scholars trying to sort of excavate, you know, what was Tolstoy trying to do? This weird, baggy monster, as I think uh, Henry James called it. You know, there's all this stuff about military strategy and there's stuff about falling in love. You know, what is this thing? And I think that uh, you know the, the consensus uh, scholarship now is that what what what, uh, what Tolstoy was trying to do was precisely to talk about you know, how do you write about real life? Because you know what, real life is like that. Because while I am thinking about a major business problem um, with one of my team, well, they go off and fall in love. And you could say that that's irrelevant, but it isn't irrelevant because it has a bearing on what it is that's going on in their life. Um, and, uh, you know, while we are dealing with our clients, uh, you know, things intervene that mean that although what they should be doing is pursuing plan A, they're pursuing plan B because they got so angry with uh, person C. And I think that that is precisely why Tolstoy chose the form that he did in War and Peace, which is to say part of what he wrote was a kind of a, a fiction with all of those wonderful, beautiful things, as you put it, that's, that are so seductive. Part of what he wrote was a kind of a, uh, an insight into, into the way strategy is, the way history is, etc. Part of what he wrote was, uh, was a, a series almost of musings. But I think that's because that was the form that he could find to talk about that. And that's precisely why I find Tol Tolstoy so helpful. So that's the first thing I'd say is I think Tolstoy was onto that problem and precisely trying to deal with it. The second thing that I would say is that uh, for that very reason, when I read Tolstoy, uh, I am reminded that I have to have my eyes open for the things that don't seem to be relevant to the problem. Because it's the things that don't seem to be relevant to the problem at hand that in the end uh, come up, sit up and bite you in the face. Yeah. So anyone who's ever been in a leadership position knows that this is true. You can sit all you like in your bathtub or your shower or whatever it is or your favourite armchair and think about how you're going to handle a particularly difficult colleague and you can have the conversation in your head a million times over and the only thing you know for sure is that whatever you think about will not happen. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'll, I'll spare uh, Paul's eyesight. Mine's already ruined yeah. by this, but anyway. <laughs> um, do you not think that, uh, to a certain extent, we're getting in your own way um, in convincing business leaders who are looking to ask people by referring to the very old terms, the humour of love, which surely there are more uh, contemporary terms that you, could, that you could be working off that might have made business people roll their eyes quite so freely? Um, 
I don't know. I think some. I think there are some contemporary texts that, that that are designed to make people roll their eyes. Actually, I can think of a few eye rollers uh, in the last few years. Uh, I understand what you mean, and we do actually use contemporary texts, and they weren't among my examples today. Just for clarification, I suppose I should have said uh, one of our principles is we don't ram this stuff down our clients' throats. The principle that we deploy is uh, one of uh, you know I, I compare it to you know if I wanted to have a conservatory built uh, for my house. I know that the people doing the building probably have some complicated mathematics and engineering that they have to do. I don't really care as long as I get a conservatory and it looks right. And most of our clients have absolutely no interest and often no idea that we approach the problems that we approach through the humanities. So we don't actually go to them and say, we think you should be reading Plato now, Mr Chief Executive, because, um, because we'd get thrown out or killed. Um, so we don't do that. Uh, what we do do is uh, we, we read Plato in order to inform our solution, in order to be better than the next person, and in order to win more work than the next person. It's a strategy that's worked pretty well for us so far. As far as the, um, as far as the dialogue is concerned, I don't know that it has to be a dialogue about the text. I think it has to be an informed dialogue about... Um, about the two cultures, if you like. So we're trying a number of different experiments at the moment. So actually we tried an experiment some time ago which was very successful but um, hasn't continued because some of the people have moved on to other places. We helped um, the University of Cambridge set up the Forum for Philosophy and Business um, in which we, we said to the philosophers, just be philosophers. No, so this isn't the business school, this is the, the faculty of philosophy. And we said to the philosophers, just be philosophers and what we'll do is we'll try and help bring businesses in to come and talk to you and to give you problems, not to deal with as consultants, but to deal with as, as philosophers. Now again, what we found there was that they often had reference to you know, whatever it happened to be, you know, Hegel or you know, Plato or Aristotle or whatever, but what the businesses were interested in was what the solution was to the problem. And that was very interesting. Another experiment we're trying now in Denmark is a process whereby we go into a company um, and we, uh, we use um, academic researchers to do uh, academic projects related to the project that we're doing. So the particular project we're working on is how uh, this particular company uh, recovers a sense of being a winning culture. It used to be a winning culture and it feels like it's lost its way. So we're working with a, a linguistician, uh, so a sociolinguistician, a, a historian uh, and an expert on representation um, who are using their skills as humanities scholars to try and understand this as if it were a text. So that's another thing we're trying. Um, anyway, I could, I could go on with a, no, a number of other things. So we, we are trying various different uh, methods for, for doing this. But you're absolutely right. If you, if you were to say to people, you know, success depends on uh, bunches of, uh, of uh, senior executives uh, reading Aristotle, I think we might as well give up now. So. In the back. It's a very good question, um, and uh, in, in the end, um, the only answer I can give you is um, instinct and knowledge and experience. So that's all I can really tell you. Um, I employ some really spectacularly smart people um, who, uh, many of them, know texts and know, for example, some of the historians, etc., you know, they know about stuff I just know nothing about, and they find things to use that are absolutely the right things uh, time after time. Um, in the end, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting process. Uh, you kind of know when you've got it right because the fit is beautiful. Um, I do feel that uh, there is a bit of a guide here, however. As I said before, contentious though it is, the canon is bloody good for this. It is contentious, but it is very good. If you go to if you go to the, the the text that really does, I mean, you know, War and Peace is the text that's all about warfare, history, strategy. That's you know, that's the text that's all about that. How life interacts with that. And there are other other pale imitators, but in the end, Tolstoy is pretty good. Yes. You mentioned the phrase. You used the phrase two cultures several times. Uh, my Common knowledge of the two cultures was the one coined by C.P. Snow when he referred to the conflict between the Arabs and 
the scientists. Yeah. I wonder is the methodology uh, useful for the solution of scientific problems? As a um, business problem. It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, and um, I, I don't know. I know that there are some, some scientists who are quite interested in uh, uh, how you might uh, move away from entirely positivistic notions of science in order to try and come up with creativity in science. Um, so uh, you know, famous here, I think, is the chemist Ilya Prigogine, for example. I don't know if you've ever come across his work, but um, he's you know, a very, very brilliant work. Um, I understand from my chemist friends that they all think that he went a bit soft and became a bad scientist when that happened. Now, I don't know if that's them being a bit like my friend in his plush office, or whether there is something problematic about this approach where science is concerned. I don't know. I do know that um, I often get asked if I believe that, if you like, the application of scientific method in business is completely hopeless. And the answer is no, I don't. I believe that there really is a scientific culture that can be very useful to apply to certain kinds of business problems. I happen to think that those problems are the least interesting. And I happen to think that if we start imagining that we can apply that scientific reasoning to all problems, we're going to hell in a handbasket. Quadrivium. Yes, thank you. Um, it's just four. Had, um, there was this uh, this idea that you would uh, spend the early part of your education on, um, on on these arts and then move on to the practical things, right? And in fact, you shouldn't dwell in these impractical things. Um, that you should learn them and find the space to your education and then move on to practical things, right? And at least in the um, in the U.S. This is classic defense of the education in the humanities or the arts, that it's the, it's a foundation for thinking that you then apply towards other things. And I find it's often used in defense of education on the, the place where it, it, it isn't used or where it, it fails a bit is, 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 again, this thing about the academics talking with the practitioners, right, that they want to remain entirely in the state. Do you think that is where we, we get this opposition from? Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I think... It, it, it's actually a, a brilliant uh, analysis of, of, of where it might have come from. I mean, you know, the, the distinction between higher thought and practical action is also, if you're ever interested in it, absolutely all over the, the metaphor of the cave in Plato's Republic. So you can go and have a look at it. And there's all sorts of different places where this might have come from, and that gets passed through Aristotle and into, into the medieval tradition, yes. I do think that we've got some contemporary diseases, however, um, there was a time when uh, you know, I felt that within the academy, I was attacked from two sides. Um, and it was, it was that time in the, in the 90s when it was still legitimate to talk about the left and the right. Seems weird now, but the left and the right was still a very, very clear opposition. And in a sense, uh, I got attacked from both sides. So the, the right in, in the academy were very keen on art for art's sake and therefore very keen on no kind of compromise, if you like, between the study of the humanities on the one hand and uh, the world on the other hand. That was where, where the right was. And then the left believed that anything that might be in league with business obviously would have you growing horns and a tail. So uh, you were stuffed both ways, really. And I think that particular, um, that particular overlay is today just as significant as the, the trace, if you like, of the, of the medieval, um, medieval thinking that uh, has gone into our education system. I've no doubt there are other explanations as well, but it, it does seem that the odds are very clearly stacked against proper dialogue. Yes? What's the motivation for people in the humanities to learn the language of business in order to be able to 
like to remember what's the motivation to even do this and I'd like to find out what the motivation is, which I thought to yourself I was thinking or I translated. Yes, uh, um, um, thanks. Um, the, the language that I translate into, uh, at least I hope I do, is the language that I think most people would understand. And I think that uh, there's a double disease here that we're suffering from. You're right, business people speak in PowerPoint. But at the beginning of my talk, I also talked about the fact that the way I was supposed to speak and write as an academic was so that three other people could understand. That's a form of PowerPoint ease. I mean, it's, it's another kind of jargon. I think both cultures have gone completely nuts it's entirely possible for me to talk to the chief executive of the large, chief executive of the largest corporations in the world and not use jargon. I probably do occasionally. I try not to. It is entirely possible for us to use the language that we've been given in order to communicate. I think that uh, business academia and humanities academia has uh, given itself, they've both given themselves too easy a ride on the creation of complex languages that ultimately defy any kind of comprehension or criticism. And that's a real danger. Because we can only engage with each other when we can understand each other. And I don't believe that it's, it's necessary to speak in highfalutin terms about Henry V if, in order to be able to communicate to the chief executive of the company why understanding that great speech before the Battle of Agincourt is relevant to things that he or she might face. So I, I, you're right, there are two languages, but is it about motivation to learn each other's language or is it about just the motivation to stop the madness and start speaking to each other in a language that we can all understand? Because it's given to us to do so. And I can't think of any ideas that can't be expressed in words that most intelligent people can understand. And if I've used jargon today, I apologise for the camera. I'm sorry. Um, we have had, um, and uh, absolutely nothing, nothing against them. It's a particular way of looking at the world. On the whole, we have the kinds of psychologists who are more interested, if you like, in the artsy end of psychology, just like uh, we have um, social scientists who are less interested in the number-crunching social science and more, if you like, in the philosophical social science. Um, again, I stress, this is not about saying that other ways of approaching problems that don't work. I know some great uh, organisational and occupational psychologists who do amazing work on consumer insight and on insight into how people work, etc. I've got nothing against it. It's just not what we do. Uh, we differentiate ourselves by saying we're, what we're interested in is what kind of knowledge can you get at when you understand the humanities. That's what we're trying to do. So from time to time we have had uh, psychologists, but on the whole they've had other degrees as well. Maurice, you have certainly convinced me, uh, I'm probably, you were probably preaching to the converted, but you have certainly convinced me that the humanities are really powerful, a very powerful tool, actually scarily powerful. So where's the ethics in this? If you think about it, you can create havoc if you believe in your own history, if you strongly feel motivated by a certain story. And if you sell that story to a company, they could wreak havoc. Uh, where will your ethical concerns? Um, you're right. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's a big, uh, big problem. And to the question about where some of the divisions in the whatever come from, uh, you know, divisions between the, the two cultures come from, you know, I would add, um, amongst many other things, uh, a post-war anxiety that uh, came after a reflection on, damn, we thought that if you read loads of good books, you would do good things. And we've got some people in Europe who read all the right books and listened to all the right music and did some very bad things. I'm trivialising, but you understand what, what the reference is to. So you're absolutely right. There are dangers involved in... Uh, in uh, trying to do some of this stuff in an ethic ethical, ethically free uh, environment. Um, I ag agree with you that there is that risk, but I don't think it's the risk of using the humanities. I think it's the risk of doing something. I think we can all avoid ethical risks by having no desires, no temptations, and no actions. 
It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, by doing that, uh, we don't actually have uh, anything to worry about. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in doing stuff. And I don't know of any way of tackling those ethical problems except to continue to examine what it is that you're doing. So, you know, it's a hackneyed line from Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. I think I would bring it out yet again. But there I think, you know, what is the discipline? What, what, where, where are the series of disciplines that have, have allowed us to examine what it is that we're doing? Not necessarily to become better people. You don't become a saint by reading the humanities. But you do become better at thinking about these things and articulating these things. And it's the humanities every single time that, that uh, contain the disciplines that do this. Why? Because history makes us think about the rights and wrongs of the past. Because philosophy makes us think about the rights and wrongs of our action. Because literature makes us understand complex situations and consider what it is that people might have done differently in ways that are imaginative and, and that other forms of uh, knowledge can't reach. So I would say uh, the arts and humanities are no protection against immorality or unethical behaviour, um, but they're the only thing we've got. Thank you. Before we thank Maurice Periotti for this inspiring talk, I'll just remind uh, all of you, uh, postgrads, people conducting postdoctoral work uh, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, uh, there will be an opportunity to meet Morris uh, and discuss some of the ideas for uh, tonight's lecture and try and probe into the, uh, the possibilities of having humanities and business meet uh, and take place in room 2026. Uh, so the arts and humanities will meet in room 26? Absolutely. Brilliant. Arts and humanities will meet in the windowless room of 2026 tomorrow at 10. In order to thank Morris properly, I'll ask the executive director of the Long Room Hub, Jennifer Edmund, to come up and do the thanks. This is not a big presentation, but it is a small gift. Um, this is something we'd like to present to you. We believe in, in the kinds of ideas that you're presenting to us and the idea that Trinity would be a fabled place for you is, is a lovely thing for us to hear. So this is our dream in glass, which is becoming a dream in glass and steel and concrete out, outside. And we hope that it will uh, um, be, be a part of your office furniture, the way that Plato and Aristotle are. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you.